Welcome to my mini lecture on Brenda Hillman's uh, poem, A Hydrology of California, which we can find in our Big Energy Poets textbook on page 93. A Hydrology of California comes from Hillman's 2009 book, Practical Water, which uh, was the winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Award. Um, in 2003, just other highlights in Hillman's career, um, she published a collection which she edited entitled The Grand Permission, New Writings on Poetics and Motherhood. And as we read in our book, Hillman describes herself as an activist for social and environmental justice. What does the title mean, A Hydrology of California? More specifically, what does hydrology mean? Uh, just looking at the word in um, its components, the second part, ology, is the study of, and we know that suffix from disciplines such as sociology or biology. In the first part, hydro means water, like hydraulics. So it's the study of water. But more specifically, hydrology is the branch of science concerned with the properties of the Earth's water and especially its movement in relation to land. And this is a very recent science. Um, which we might say from the perspective of the Anthropocene marks a type of humanistic hubris in the idea, not that water can't be studied as a science, but with that science is this notion of how do we control it for our own purposes, um, to have a world that where water is always at our fingertips, right? That we could turn a faucet on whenever we want, we can water lawns whenever we want, so again, this is not just an objective science of studying of water. It's a science that has practical use in water management. And again, so when you think of the title, A Hydrology of California, and the title of her book, Practical Water, it's that practicality that we can use water for our own purposes and not recognize it as a finite, fragile life source the most foundational ecology on this earth. Instead, we treat it as a resource we can manipulate, which starts with seeing water through this paradigm of science, through this prism of practicality, through this prism of utilitarianism, which of course is at the center of capitalism. To gain some critical purchase on the poem, on the hydrology of California, it's helpful to turn to Hillman's poetics, which, which, which we can find on pages 94 to 95. And she titles her poetics Beyond Emergency. And I want to read and think about two quotes. How does poetry move past models of emergency to models of chronic imagination so we can abandon ideas of progress and salvation? Such an interesting, provocative question. How, do, how does poetry move past models of emergency to models of chronic imagination? A um, few things I really love about this quote. Um, first of all, I love the adjectival use of chronic modifying imagination. That chronic usually has negative connotations, like chronic pain. But that the, the paradigm we should be in is that we should have a type of chronic imagination. Our imagination should be radically open. And as we'll see in a moment, she's, uh, Hillman's going to propose that we need to have a conception of radical imagination. But how does poetry move past models of emergency to models of chron chronic imagination? And why this is so important, um, as Hillman makes us recognize, is that if we realize that we're, if we think we're in an emergency, there's the idea that we can somehow Co collectively coordinate and get out of the emergency to get back to normal, that we can progress, that we can be saved. But instead of recognizing to think about the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene as an emergency or a crisis that, again, that could be alleviated, that we can progress beyond, we need to recognize it as the semi-permanent condition. And therefore, we need again, what Hillman's calls a chronic imagination. Hillman also asks, quote, are there interventions writers are equipped to make in times of ecological disaster? And I, 
I think this is really useful as you think about this week's poetry and to name what are the interventions that Hillman makes um, to address the ecological disaster. Again, this isn't relying on tropes or genres or aesthetics of the past. These are new aesthetic interve interventions because of what's recognized as an unprecedented ecological calamity. In the second paragraph of her Poetics, Hillman introduces the concept of radical imagination. And the radical imagination, as she writes, quote, reconfigures realism and emotion through sensuous observation. There's so much to think about here, but this need to see anew and to feel anew starts with, is rooted with, sensual observation, embodied observation, with us engaging with the natural world through our senses. And the adjective of sensual is really powerful, but uh, we can't help but notice the erotic charge of it. Um, sensual could just mean the senses, but they're, at least the way I think we could read sensual there, is a loving observation. Right, that um, if if you happen to see um, Lady Bird, the movie Lady Bird, lectures go in such random directions. <laughs> um, one of the nuns tells the central character, whose name I'm, whose name is Lady Bird, although I'm thinking of the actress's name, and I'm totally rambling. Let's get back on track. Um, that. Attention is another form of love. I love that line from that movie. It's, my, I think, one of my favorite lines of that movie, actually from the year it came out. But to me, that idea that attention is another word for love is almost saying the same thing as sensual observation, is not to see objectively or dispassionately or neutrally, is to be embodied and engaged and to see and to hear with, with love. So Hillman is combining the radical imagination to the formation of, quote, a new ecological poetry. And the principles, the guiding principles of this radical imagination that will mark the best ecological poetry is inspired by William Blake. Um, they are one, meta the formation of new metaphors for emotion in relation to matter and the non-human world. And as I broach each principle of some of the radical imaginative markings of this new ecological poetry, maybe have in your notes till when you start to analyze this poem what are these new metaphors in this poem that relate to the non-human world and to matter, right? To animals, to water. Um, if you can analyze one, two, or three metaphors that's doing this work, I think that's a great way to organize this post. Uh, the second one is the relationship to words and phrases. It's such an interesting idea um, that the work of the radical imagination which is linked again to this new ecological poetry, is to helping us think more reflectively and in more complex ways about the relationship between words and phrases against something else you might analyze and look for as you're reading this poem. Third is interdisciplinary knowledge. And again, this is something we've seen throughout the semester, but it's so surprising that so many of these poems and these poets are training training themselves, disciplining themselves to think in non-disciplinary or interdisciplinary ways. This is such a break from older models of aesthetic training where you would just focus in on the discipline of literature. Hillman says explicitly, but all the poets we've read have said in uh, different ways, we need to be more interdisciplinary and that interdisciplinary knowledge needs to inform our poetry. 
And finally, recognizing that poetry is a type of protest, even if, as Hillman writes, these, quote, small protests, they may seem prodigiously useless. There's an awareness that poetry, the activism of poetry, is not going to change the world. In fact, on the surface, and the poet, poet recognizes it, it might seem completely wasteful, prodigiously useless. Nevertheless, it's a form of protest and an important form of protest. So again, if you want to look at any one of these four principles and thinking about how they're operating in the poem, or look at all of them if you want to challenge yourself, again, that's a really wonderful way to look at the poem. To gain even a more specific purchase on her poem, A Hydrology of California, it's worth turning to pages 99 to 100, where Hillman discusses the form this poem takes. We can read together, quote, the selection from Hydrology of California corresponds to the southernmost California watershed. It is from a long poem in Practical Water, in which I was playing on the line A River of Rivers in Connecticut by Wallace Stevens, and addressing the hydro hydrological, hydrological regions and the various dams of California. The poem ends up south of L.A. I made up a form, three broken lines, though there is one four-line stanza here, alternating with two shorter lines to give an even but also jagged rhythm and look as the poem is damned repeatedly with slashes and its energy released. I mean, this is so brilliant. Um, so formally, as she explains, she wanted the materiality of the dam to inform the poem itself. As she says, the poem is damned. There's slashes um, everywhere. Um, and maybe to make sense of this a little more, we have to understand what damming is. If you want to study the materiality, materiality of dams, I really recommend the article, How Dams Damage Rivers in American Rivers. Um, and I think the key things to take away are that dams are destructive. They destroy rivers. Specifically, they prevent the flow of rivers. And we're going to see how this informs Hillman's poem, um, the materiality and the aesthetics of flow. Um, rivers no longer run their natural course towards oceans. Rather, humans create dams um, and alter the flow of water. So the two things to think about this, again, we'll see in the, if you turn to the poem, we'll look at it together. The poem is dammed up. But damming is also an aesthetic practice. Those of us who creatively write how important a state of flow is, an uninterrupted flow, is the height of creativity. And that is also disabled by creating this dam aesthetics, aesthetics of damming, um, to show how fragmented our world is. And again, I think it's so brilliant that fragmentation doesn't become a free-floating um, signifier of postmodernism, but rather a specific response to this geography of dams we've created to enable a world where we can manipulate and control water to have access to water whenever we want. Again, that's the liberal fantasy, which is not true. Um, but we can ask, if Hillman recognizes her poetry as a form of protest, what type of protest is possible in a geography of dams, of aquatic destruction and death, which in the dominant culture of globalization, especially in the United States, is kept invisible beyond the regime of visibility? We don't think enough about where our waters come from and how that we manage and manipulate waters to have the world that we do today.